Hi, everyone. So um, what I want to do is tell you about a technology that grew out of a curiosity-driven research project in my lab here at Berkeley. And I'm going to start by just um, posing the question. Suppose we had a way to go into cells and make a very precise change to the DNA of the cell, so precise that we could change a single base pair in the entire human genome, for example, much like we might fix a typo in a Word document. Sounds like science fiction, but this is actually a technology that is now in our hands. And it really came about through not a focused effort to discover such a technology, but actually through a curiosity-driven research project that was aimed at figuring out how bacteria fight the flu, fight viral infection. And uh, for me, this project really started with a great um, uh, conversation that I had with a colleague here at Berkeley, Jillian Banfield, who is in the College of Natural Resources at Berkeley. And uh, Jill does a lot of work with bacteria. She, she likes to focus on bacteria that have never been, never been isolated, never been cultured in the laboratory. She's trying to understand what's out there in terms of the microbial world. And in the course of her research, she came across a very interesting observation, which was namely that a lot of bacteria have a, a, a very unusual sequence signature present somewhere in the DNA genome of the cell um, that looks like, like this, where you have a series of repeated DNA sequences, about 40 base pairs in length, and in between those repeats are unique sequences of also about 40 base pairs in length, and people since 1987 had occasionally noticed these in their data, and had, these had come to be called CRISPRs, which stands for Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, a big mouthful, we like to use CRISPR, and it refers to this pattern of DNA sequences that can occur in bacterial genomes. And uh, the reason that Jill called me about this was that we were working away in my lab here at Berkeley on ways that small RNA molecules can control the expression of genes, much as what you just heard about in Gary Rovkin's talk. And we were trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that underlie those pathways. And Jill wondered whether there might actually be a role for RNA molecules in a uh, pathway that might stem from the presence of these sequences because in 2005, three labs had pointed out that when, you, when they looked at these CRISPR loci, they found that these unique sequences in between the repeats very often corresponded exactly to sequences that could be found in the viruses that infect these bacteria. And so together with that observation and the fact that ne next door to these sequences are typically a set of CRISPR-associated or CAS genes, that co-vary with the sequences over here, the idea was maybe this is some way that bacteria record over time the infections that they've experienced from viruses, keep a little genetic record in the context of this kind of a sequence pattern, and then somehow use that sequence information to protect the cells. And Jill thought, wouldn't it be amazing if that was happening uh, through production of RNA molecules, little copies of these sequences that might be made and used by these cells. And she knew we were working on RNA, so she wondered if we would like to test that idea. And so what, uh, what emerged what, over the next several years, um, and it, the interest, uh, one of the interesting twists to this story is that the first genetic data uh, experiments to test this idea of a bacterial immune system came from work done at a yogurt company, uh, Danisco, by Rodolf Barango and Philippe Horvath, was to show that, in fact, bacteria that have a CRISPR locus can defend themselves. They can acquire immunity to, bac to phage, bacteriophage, that infect the cell by detecting that foreign DNA as it gets injected, here shown by a virus, injecting this into a cell. Little bits of that foreign DNA are integrated into the CRISPR locus in such a way that they are stored there permanently. They can be passed on to the next generation of bacteria. And then those DNA sequences are copied into RNA and form the basis for targeted recognition of sequences that have the same, have, have a matching sequence to what was recorded originally. And those, so these RNA molecules are, uh, are broken up into bits that each include one sequence derived from a virus. They assemble with proteins, one or more proteins encoded by the Cas genes, to form RNA protein 
targeting complexes that use the sequence information in the RNA to base pair with foreign DNA and allow these proteins to cut up the viral DNA. So this seemed like a very interesting uh, parallel, actually, to RNA interference and micro, the way that microRNAs work, as, as Gary uh, described in the previous talk. And so we thought it would be really interesting to figure out how bacteria actually do this. What's the mechanism for this kind of a defense pathway? And so in my lab, we started working on this central part of the pathway, namely how these RNA molecules are created in the cell, how they assemble with proteins, and how they carry out this targeting uh, mechanism. And what emerged from that was a series of, of, um, of uh, mechanistic insights that led us to eventually uh, partner with a colleague of mine, Emmanuel Charpentier, who was at the time in, in, located in Sweden, a medical microbiologist. And we decided to work together to understand the molecular function of a particular Cas protein called Cas9 that is the only gene necessary in some bacteria for this viral, uh, this, uh, viral defense pathway to function. And what emerged from that collaboration was that Cas9 is a very interesting protein uh, that is essentially programmable, can be programmed with these bits of CRISPR-derived uh, RNA molecules. And so by doing experiments with purified proteins and RNAs in our laboratories, we figured out that Cas9 has the ability to recognize double-stranded DNA at sequences that match a 20-nucleotide sequence present in the CRISPR RNA, which is this molecule that's shown right here in this cartoon. And at those sequences, the Cas9 protein opens up the DNA double helix, positioning two active sites in the protein to generate a double-stranded break in the DNA. Now, there were a couple of interesting twists to the way this works. We found out, first of all, that this targeting has to occur adjacent to a little motif called the PAM sequence in the DNA. So for this particular uh, Cas9 protein, that's a GG dinucleotide motif in the DNA, or two GC base pairs next to each other. And the other thing was that this, actually, uh, this uh, system actually requires a second RNA molecule called tracer, which is this red molecule right here, which can interact by base pairing with the end of the CRISPR RNA. It forms a structure that recruits the Cas9 protein. So you really have to have both of these RNAs and the protein, and then you can get this kind of targeted double-stranded DNA cutting. And so once Martin Jinek in my lab had figured this out, he realized that he could actually sort of like a good biochemist, he was trimming away at these RNAs, and he realized that he might actually be able to simplify the system relative to what nature has done to create a two-component system, a single RNA that would have the targeting ability and the Cas9 capability in the same molecule. And so he created a chimeric uh, single guide form of the RNA that has the targeting information in the molecule right here, and then it has the Cas9 binding information over here. And so this is an RNA that can be programmed by simply changing this 20 nucleotide sequence to direct it to different sites in a DNA where uh, we as scientists might want to introduce a double-stranded break in DNA and, um, and, and actually have this, uh, this uh, protein go to that site and create the double-stranded break. And so just to show you how this, how this actually works, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this in a couple of minutes, but this is a 3D printed model of uh, the Cas9 protein in white with its guide RNA in orange and a DNA molecule running through the protein. And you can actually see this DNA double helix coming in. As it enters the protein, it actually opens up and allows uh, interaction of this 20 nucleotide stretch of the DNA with the RNA. So you get an RNA-DNA hybrid inside the protein. The other strand of the DNA is peeled away, and this allows the two molecular blades in the protein to actually make a very precise cut in the DNA. Now, um, so this was sort of the moment for us when this project went from being a kind of a cool, fun project to realizing that we might be uh, sitting on a really exciting technology. And the reason to think that was that in parallel with the very uh, sleepy field of CRISPR biology at that time was a lot of research that had gone on over the past couple of decades showing that in animal and plant cells, there's very sophisticated machinery for detecting double-stranded DNA breaks in those cells and fixing them. 
And so when cells, if, if this is genomic uh, piece of uh, segment out of a, a genome, a genomic DNA, if that DNA is broken at a site, we have a double-stranded break in the DNA, these cells can repair that break through a process called non-homologous end joining that leads to a, typically a little disruption in the DNA sequence as the ends are pasted back together. Or if there's a donor uh, DNA template in the cell, that molecule can be recombined into the DNA if there's a little bit of overlapping uh, homologous sequence to actually introduce new genetic information at exactly the site where the double-stranded break occurred. And so uh, scientists had appreciated this and had been working away for a while to try to figure out how do we how do we introduce double-stranded breaks exactly where we want to make a change in a genome? And so um, some technologies for doing this had come along that were actually very promising. And these were, are shown here, zinc finger nucleases or talon proteins or homing endonucleases are all uh, protein-based technologies that require engineering a new protein that can recognize a particular DNA sequence and by coupling it to a cleaving domain of a protein, then you can have a, an engineered enzyme that will actually make a double-stranded break in DNA exactly where you want it. And these can work very well, and you might have seen very recently uh, in the news a story about a child that, a one-year-old child that had leukemia, and they were actually able to use a talon-based strategy to uh, create a cancer immunotherapy that was effective in her case. So these therapies, can, these uh, kinds of technologies can be extremely powerful. The challenge was, that they're also very labor intensive. A new protein had to be engineered for every experiment. And so it just meant that most scientists around the world had not been able to adopt this technology. It was too expensive, it was too time consuming, and it required uh, too much expertise. We thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could use one protein, never have to change it, and re redirect it to create a targeted double-stranded break by simply changing the sequence of a short guide RNA that is quite uh, easy to do by standard molecular biology methods. And so that was exactly what we proposed when we published this work in the summer of 2012, was that this could be a very interesting uh, way to do RNA-programmed genome editing. And so what happened next was, uh, really uh, quite amazing, and that is that a, a number of labs around the world saw this paper and started to test it in different systems. And this is a, a slide I got from my uh, colleague at North Carolina State University, Rodolfo Marengo, and showing just the sort of exponential adoption of the CRISPR technology over the last three years as people start using it worldwide for different kinds of applications. And in fact, even before the end of 2012, there were six papers submitted for publication from different labs, in, uh, including our own, showing that you could use this technology for engineering human cells, but also for actually engineering entire organisms like zebrafish. So it's uh, one of the things that's made it so exciting is that it's a platform for doing genome engineering that uh, works essentially in any uh, system where people have tested it. So, um, you know, people have asked me, why did this technology take off in a way that these earlier technologies didn't? And I think there are really sort of three answers to that question. One is what I like to call software versus hardware, where the older technologies were protein-based and effectively hardwired. You had to recreate or create a new protein or pair of proteins for every experiment. Here, we have something that you, is sort of more analogous to software. We can reprogram a single protein easily using a small uh, fragment of RNA. So it just means that it's a, it's a technology that is easily adopted and tested in different systems. And because it generally is effective in these cells, people have been able to employ it for all sorts of applications. Um, it works in, as I mentioned, in, in essentially any uh, animal and plant system that's been tested so far. And as I want to share with you now, we know that this has evolved in bacteria for uh, rapid and accurate DNA recognition, which means that it's, it's really very useful for lots of applications where you need precision in uh, the editing that you want to do. So I'm going to show you, I want to show you a short movie, um, if you can play the movie. So this is sort of our, how we imagine uh, this might operate in a eukaryotic cell. So here we are zooming into the cell, and as we uh, look inside the nucleus, of course, in eukaryotic cells, the DNA is highly packaged in chromatin. So somehow this bacterial enzyme has to deal with uh, DNA that's wound around uh, histones here to form these nucleosome structures. It has to find a single target site, for example, in a genome that has a 20 base pair match to the guide 
RNA and the protein. And when it does, it opens up the DNA and the molecular blades in the protein make this double-stranded break. And now we have a break in the DNA that has to be repaired and the cell has machinery for doing that in this example here by introducing or recombining in a segment of DNA that introduces new information into this uh, particular genome. And it does that in a targeted fashion. And so, you know, people are now using this to engineer plants, animals, uh, lots of organisms that in the past were genetically intractable by using uh, this kind of a strategy. So how does it work? And that's something that, you know, my lab is very keen to understand. We feel like, you know, the opportunity to understand this at a molecular level is not only interesting and re reveals fundamental biology, but it actually will be very important for ensuring that this technology is really going to be useful for doing things like uh, curing human genetic disease. So um, one of the things that's been very interesting about this uh, protein Cas9 is that it's easily modified. And you'll hear about this later uh, from Jonathan Weissman. His lab has done a lot of this work. But basically, it's been possible to make uh, this protein into a version that is deactivated for DNA cleavage. It can bind DNA in a targeted way, but not actually generate a double-stranded break. And then that protein can also be coupled to functional domains that allow genes to be turned on or turned off in a very specific fashion. So that's a very powerful application of this that doesn't involve um, any genome engineering it's per se. It doesn't involve making double-stranded breaks in the DNA of a genome. Um, and people have also been able to use that kind of approach for imaging, uh, looking at particular sites in a genome by lighting them up using a fluorescently labeled version of this protein. It's naturally multiplexed, and what I mean by that is that in bacteria, bacteria naturally will program this protein with a variety of different guide RNAs because they want to protect the cell from multiple viruses at the same time. That means that as scientists, we can do the same thing as a technology. We can program this protein with multiple different guide RNAs in the same experiment, in the same cell, and have multiple places in the genome where we introduce precise changes. So it's a very powerful way uh, to do a lot of uh, experimentation at the genetic level in, uh, in, in a single experiment. And as I mentioned, it's evolved for rapid and accurate DNA target recognition. And I would just like to share with you a few uh, recent uh, uh, sets of data that we've obtained in the lab that help us understand how this actually works. So one of the things that emerged early on, so this, was a, this is a cartoon that illustrates work that we did collaboratively with Eva Nogales, a professor here at UC Berkeley who is a specialist in cryoelectron microscopy. We worked with her laboratory, two uh, graduate students, David Taylor and D Sam Sternberg, who teamed up to look at the Cas9 protein structure as it goes from protein alone to assembling with nucleic acids. And what those experiments revealed, even at about 30 angstrom resolution, so not very high resolution, we could see that this protein, when it's in the uh, protein alone state, it starts off in a closed conformation in which the two uh, uh, sort of structural parts of the protein are, are close together. As soon as it assembles with guide RNA, those protein lobes rearrange to open up a channel in the center of the protein, which is where the DNA ends up once, it, once this uh, complex assembles with a substrate or a target uh, DNA molecule. So we already got the sense, even at this, this sort of low resolution experiment, that there was something very interesting going on with the way this protein rearranged as it assembled with nucleic acid. And now I want to show you a movie that, and hold on just a second, uh, I want to show you a movie that is going to illustrate uh, the conformational changes now using a series of crystallographic structures available for Cas9. So we have much higher resolution snapshots of this protein in different states. And if we morph these together, you can actually see that this protein undergoes a remarkable structural change as it assembles with nucleic acid. So please um, start the movie. So this starts off with the protein in the closed state. As it morphs to the structure bound to RNA, you saw a big rearrangement in this part of the protein here to accommodate the RNA, and here's the central channel where this guide strand of the RNA ends up, and that's actually where the RNA-DNA hybrid will form once a substrate binds. Now, when the DNA substrate binds, there's an additional conformational change in the protein to accommodate that RNA-DNA hybrid here in the center of the protein. And importantly, this domain right here in yellow is one of the catalytic 
cleavers. This is one of the domains that actually cuts the DNA. And we found that in all of the available crystal structure, this domain is in the wrong place. It's over here. It's in the wrong place to actually cut the DNA. It's about 30 angstroms away from where it needs to be. And so what you just saw was our imagined uh, sort of modeling of how this domain would have to swing into place to actually uh, be a functional cleaver and to be able to cut the DNA. And so what's emerged um, in our, in our uh, recent experiments in a paper that was just very recently uh, published last week, we were able to show using fluorescent dyes on this protein that we can actually detect this series of conformational changes by following changes in fluorescence as these dyes move into different positions during this uh, series of conformational changes. And what we learned from that is that we eventually do detect, of course, this active state of the protein. And we think that that, uh, that active state only occurs when this protein is docked on a DNA molecule that has a perfect match, or at least a very close to perfect match, to the guide RNA. So it really has a way of ensuring that it only cuts DNA that is matched to the guide RNA. Otherwise, it sometimes can bind to uh, DNAs that are off targets, that don't have a perfect match to the guide. But because the cleaver is not in the right place, the DNA does not get cut, OK? All right, so the other thing that we're doing, so you know, these experiments that I've showed you are all in vitro. That means we're working with purified proteins, nucleic acids, and doing experiments to try to figure out mechanism. Of course, we would really like to figure out how does this actually operate inside of a cell? And if you think about it, it's a really interesting challenge because this is a protein that has evolved over time in bacteria. And so it has to deal with bacterial genomes, which are a lot smaller than uh, eukaryotic genomes, like the human genome, and also don't have the kind of highly compacted structures that we see in chromatin in eukaryotic cells. And so how does a bacterial enzyme deal with that? And so here, this is just a picture of, the uh, of, a, of a, 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 um, a nucleosome in the eukaryotic nucleus. And here's the cartoon of the Cas9 protein and what it actually has to do on the DNA. So how does it do this when it's got to deal with DNA that's wrapped up like this? And, um, and so we're sort of, the questions we're sort of thinking about is how does it deal not only with chromatin structure, but also the larger size of mammalian genomes, as well as the, uh, the sort of overall organization of DNA in the nucleus. And so to start to answer those questions, Spencer Knight, a graduate student here who is uh, jointly in my lab and the lab of Robert Tejan, has been working on a system to detect and visualize Cas9 uh, complexes as they search through the DNA of, uh, of a eukaryotic cell, of a mammalian cell. And so I want to just show you a little bit of his data. So um, basically what we can do is we can fluorescently label Cas9 proteins that are inside living cells. So we're looking, we're visualizing live cell nuclei, and we're watching particles of the Cas9 protein moving around the nucleus. And when we program Cas9 with what Spencer calls a nonsense guide, a guide RNA that shouldn't recognize any particular sequence in that genome, we see very rapid movement of those particles. And we can plot this, and we have the log of the diffusion coefficient here, and the number of particles over here, and you can see that most of these particles are moving very, very rapidly around the cell with respect, and certainly a lot faster than a protein uh, that is uh, part of the chromatin structure called H2B that has much, much slower kinetics in the cell. But we see a very interesting change when we program Cas9 with a guide RNA that recognizes about 300,000 sites in the nucleus. So th this is a, a highly repetitive element in the mammalian uh, genome. And now we find that these, a lot of these particles are moving much more slowly in the cell. You can really see that visually here. And if we plot these, we see almost a, a sort of um, two different populations of molecules, some that are still moving with very fast kinetics, but a large number now that are moving very, very slowly. And we think these correspond to particles that have actually parked themselves on a complementary sequence in the genome, and they hold on. They don't let go. And we're actually, in these experiments, we're using a catalytically inactive form of the protein, so we're not actually cutting the DNA. And so through, 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 uh, through doing this kind of experiment, we've been able to do things like measure uh, the kinetics of, of target search in the cell. And we're working right now to try to measure how long it actually takes a single particle of Cas9 to find a single target site in the human genome and really understand uh, how many molecules do we really have to have in the genome to get efficient editing. And this should help us also to avoid uh, off-target effects. So finally, I just want to um, sort of 
uh, mention what I think, uh, sort of going forward, what some of the challenges are going to be to using this technology. And I think one of the big ones is how do we deliver this? Um, the other big one, I, feel, I think, is how we control the way that the DNA is repaired in cells after the cut is made. But certainly, we have to be able to deliver it in the first place, get it into tissues. And uh, wouldn't it be lovely if we could get it into tissues in a specific fashion so that only the tissue where you want uh, therapeutic editing to occur um, will, will happen? And so we've been thinking about doing this, um, again, from the perspective of biochemists. We like the idea of using a pre-assembled protein RNA complex for delivery. And we call these RNPs. This stands for RNA uh, ribonucleoprotein or RNA protein complex. And um, the idea is simply to take purified Cas9 protein, assemble it with one or more guide RNAs that will direct it to sites where we want to induce uh, editing and then deliver it into cells. And there are different ways to, to do that. We're currently doing it with a chemical strategy. And uh, we find that when we do this uh, with cells in the, in the cultured in the lab, we can actually detect editing within a few hours, just a couple of hours. Sort of amazing to think about that in this, uh, this uh, protein is able to search through the human genome, make a cut, and the cut will be repaired in a way that we can detect within just a couple of hours. Um, secondly, we know that the half-life of the ribonucleoprotein complex is about 24 hours, and that, we think, will really minimize off-target effects. And finally, and this is the work of, of both uh, Brett Stahl and Stephen Lin in the laboratory, who have been really developing this methodology, the idea was to take this approach and use it to co-deliver DNA templates for repair. And the idea there is to help control the repair pathway by um, having the template for repair be present with the tool that's doing the cutting. And Steve and Brett have seen really nice uh, results using this kind of strategy. And we've also been working closely with Alex Marson and Jennifer Puck, who are immunologists at UC San Francisco, to use this for editing primary human T cells. And in uh, partnership with their labs, we've been able to show that we can actually uh, edit uh, human T cells not only to make knockouts of genes, but actually to make knock-ins using this kind of strategy. So there's a lot of excitement about this because, of course, this now opens, uh, opens the door to being able to edit these immune cells in, a, in a, a targeted and precise fashion for doing things like cancer immunotherapy and, um, of course, for lots of uh, research purposes as well. And, um, Jacob Korn, I want to mention as well, has been a part of this project as part of the Innovative uh, Genomics Initiative that we have going as a partnership between Berkeley and UCSF. So I just want to close by, by sort of um, as posing this question. So what should we do now that genomes can be edited uh, relatively easily? And I started really uh, thinking about this a lot you know, in, the, in the first few months after uh, this technology was, was, was out and, and being utilized by more and more laboratories and realizing that you know, there was the potential to do a lot of very exciting things with this, but also uh, some, some things that maybe we should be thinking about in a more cautionary fashion. And I realized that the science was moving at 1,000 miles an hour with papers coming out you know, daily and accelerating, as I showed you. And meanwhile, most uh, non-scientists were really unaware of what we were all doing in our labs. And so I decided to, to really get out in front of that conversation. And so with the Innovative Genomics Initiative, and Jonathan Weissman, who's part of it uh, here, we uh, decided to convene a meeting in the early part of 2015 with a few scientists from around California and a few uh, from elsewhere in Boston to come out and discuss this question. And the upshot of that meeting was to publish a, what we call a prudent path forward for genome engineering that particularly focused on editing the human germline. That means making uh, changes, precise changes, to human embryos or eggs or sperm in such a way that those changes could be passed on to future generations. And this has led to the, a call for a global uh, conversation about this in the scientific and, and broader communities. And next month in December, there will be the first international summit in Washington sponsored by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Science in the US, and the Royal Society in the UK, with lots of participation from scientists around the world and others who are interested to come and discuss this very issue and how we should proceed as, uh, in a safe and appropriate fashion. So stay tuned uh, for that. And I'd like to close by thanking my labs. This is a really a great group of people. I tried to uh, mention all of those that were involved in this research along the way. I see some of them in the audience. It's great. And, um, and of course, I want to uh, uh, give a, re a real shout out to our wonderful collaborators 
including uh, the folks at UCSF, this has really been a great opportunity for a basic researcher like me to take a technology that grew out of our our uh, sort of uh, you know homegrown lab uh, efforts and uh, see it really uh, evolving into something that I think is going to be really impactful in the clinic. And then of course we couldn't do any of this without funding. We're extremely grateful to all of these groups and in particular to the National Science Foundation who gave me a very small grant to support one student that allowed us to get going on this project before anybody knew uh, it would turn into this kind of a technology. So thank you very much. We have time for some questions. I see one in the back over there. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Uh, with the uh, last paper that you'd referenced uh, about the social implications of this technology, are you are you, are you kind of alluding to the idea of uh, uh, editing genomes of, of human embryos or you know the existing cells that would like in that are in storage right now or like what what exactly kind of are the consequences of this? Uh, right. Well, so I think I think just to be clear, there's to, you know sort of a, important to make the distinction between editing cells in an adult, right, somatic cell editing, which means that we could make changes in, say, a tissue that would have a therapeutic benefit, but not in a way that, that, that those changes would be passed on, passed on to children, right? Whereas germline editing refers to making changes such that the eggs and sperm of that, the person that would develop from that edited embryo would contain those changes, so they'd be passed on to future generations. And we're really proposing that that latter type of editing is something that you know, really raises ethical and societal questions and needs to be thoroughly considered before proceeding. Jennifer, maybe I can ask. Uh, okay. the, one of the big challenges is to make sure that you don't have off-target effects. Do, does the structural analysis explain to you how even a single base mismatch uh, could m prevent the cleaving, for example, or prevent uh, the function? Yeah, I think one, one thing that's very interesting is that this series of conformational changes that happen in the protein are really happening as a function of cognate base pairing between the target DNA and the guide RNA, such that we even see that when there's a, where the, when there's a mismatch in the RNA-DNA hybrid that occurs um, at the, there's sort of one end of that duplex that's a little more tolerant to mismatches than the other, but even at that more tolerant end, we see that there's an effect on the ability of that conformational change to put the cleavage domain in the right place to cut the DNA. And we know this from our fluorescence-based studies. So I think the answer is yes, and I'm really interested to see if we can now take that mechanistic understanding and use it to help either design or evolve proteins that maybe have even better uh, accuracy. I see one. question over here and over there. Oh, a couple, yeah. I don't know how much time. There, I guess. Well, anyway, I'll just I mean, I'll talk loudly. Your picture looked like the the, the, the um, Cas9 was popping on and off of the DNA rather than sliding along it. Was that just because there was such a sh small plane of focus, or do you no. think it pops on and off? That's right? what it, that's what we think. All of our around. both of our in vitro, our, both our in vitro and our cell based data are consistent with a diffusion model. So it's basically you know diffusing rapidly around the cell. It's binding and releasing the DNA very quickly rather than so sliding processively along the DNA. Yeah. Okay, maybe one more question. Yeah, I had um, a question related to the off-target. So you mentioned that some of the specificity comes from that rotation of the cleavage domain. And so do you think that all of the technologies that use a dead Cas9, or like a Cas9 that doesn't cleave, might actually have different off-targets than the sort of like traditional double strand break? <laughs> Right now, I, I would answer, I would say no. And the reason is that these deactivated forms of Cas9 that people are working with are point mutations in the active site. Okay, so like a single amino acid change. 
So that's a big domain that has to swing into place. And we think we have, we, we've, we've not really tested these D, let's see, I'm trying to think if we have done the FRET, I think the FRET experiments have not been done with the deactivated form of the protein for the most part, but we have no reason to think that that domain motion in the protein wouldn't happen even when you have a point mutation in the DNA, in the, in the protein. But that, that might be something that would be interesting to look at actually, yeah. Thank, okay, thank you. Thank you.